fall is Psalms, real faith for real life. That the Psalms in Scripture are prayers, they're songs, they're complaints, they're laments, they're thanksgiving, they're praise. All these things are part of life. There are times when we are sad, times when we are angry, times when we are thankful, times when we are happy, times when we're just confused. The Psalms go through all of these emotions. All these times in our lives. And so we are going to be exploring different psalms in these different areas because the psalms represent real faith for our real lives. And so we start with Psalm 1 this morning. My question first is, have you ever seen delight? Delight, what does it look like? To me, delight looks like my dog Lena when I bring home a plastic bag from PetSmart and she hears a squeak come from it. And I pull out a toy and she's just suddenly bouncing up and down. She starts shaking her head left and right and just this big grin and she's bouncing, she's jumping at the toy and you, you give her the toy, she grabs it and she just starts slinging left and right. She throws on the couch, she jumps on the couch, she buries the toy, she unburies the toy, she runs around the room, she is just so full of life and excitement. To me, that's what delight is like. She just can't contain her excitement. Delight to me is like children playing in one of those fountains in the center of the city on one of those 100 degree summer days. Jumping up and down so their feet splash little bits of water on the concrete up. Running and jumping over squirts, trying to catch the squirts of water when it comes up. Children running and playing, laughing and smiling and just soaking it all in. That's what delight looks like to me. What does delight look like to you? Now, for me, delight's probably not going to look like the South Carolina Gamecocks football season this year. <laughs> what does delight look like to you, though? I'm guessing Jerry Randall won't say Michigan football game yesterday. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> game doesn't do very well either. What does delight look like to you? When's a time that you have just been filled with delight? This is for you to share. What does delight look like? When do you remember just being filled with delight? When a grandchild is born. Yeah. When else have you been filled with delight? Adopt a child when you get married. When you retire. <laughs> Anybody else? Time when you were just filled with delight. When I saw the camel. When you saw a camel? Yeah, when you're in the desert and you need something, you see that camel. There's just delight. When you feel like your life has been saved, when a lifeline is thrown to you, when you're shedding water and that buoy comes near. We delight. We often, a lot of these names were these big life events. But what about everyday life? When do we delight? You know what I don't delight in? Laws. Some laws are just plain annoying and debilitating. And do I really have to get a new sticker for my license plate every year and pay a hundred bucks to Jesse White? I mean, why, why do I need a passport just to go to Canada? I mean, it's just right up the road, and they're expensive. Why can't I go as fast as I want on the interstate? South Carolina is a long way off. Why do I only get to go 60 at times? I mean, some laws I'm fine with, and I agree with. I don't want people to go around murdering each other. Robbery is bad. It's probably good that everyone has to have car insurance, especially when someone hits you and they're at fault. I mean, sure, laws are annoying sometimes, and we question them. Others. We're thankful for, but does anyone delight in the law? I mean, even lawyers sometimes are all that excited about flipping through every single legal code there is. I mean, do we get as excited as Lena dogs with a toy or a child playing in water on a hot day when we consider the law? So we're looking at Psalms this fall. The Psalms represent real faith for real life. In the first psalm, this psalm that opens up this book filled with faithful expressions suggests 
that those who find delight in the law of God are those who are happy and blessed. They are the ones like trees planted by streams of water. Their roots grow deep. They grow tall and full of life. So let's listen together to the faith of the author of the opening psalm. And since these psalms were originally written to be sung, we're going to hear it that way uh, this morning. And Aaron's going to lead uh, and sing Psalm 1 for us as we hear the word of the Lord. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. Did you hear that? It said, Happy are those whose delight is the law of the Lord. On God's law they meditate day and night. Now, can I be honest for a second? I mean, most people who are legalistic about laws and just delight in seeing every single one followed usually don't come across as the happiest of people to me. I think of puritanical pilgrims with stern faces in the old paintings. When I think delightful and happy, I don't think Miles Standish. And also, I'm going to be honest, I'm not big on meditation. I like studying all, but studying God's law day and night just doesn't seem like the most fun-filled time, you know? Especially now that football is back on television. <laughs> and I think most of you might agree with me because many of you probably wouldn't be too pleased if we just had a 12-hour service today meditating on the Scripture. Day and night meditating on the law? When we thought church attendance was declining in this country already, imagine 24-hour church services seven days a week. Would anyone come? Do we find delight in that? I guess it all depends on what we consider the law of the Lord. I mean, studying and meditating on all the rules and regulations found in Leviticus might get pretty tiresome after all. All the laws about how to plant your crops, what to do about boring oxen, what to eat, what to do if you become unclean. Is that the law of the Lord? Yes, in part it is. But there's got to be something more, right? I mean, the psalmist seems so convinced that we are happy and blessed if we delight in God's law and meditate on it day and night. I mean, I can't imagine being that happy, really knowing what to do in every situation if my ox bore someone in your family. But the psalmist says when we delight and we meditate on God's law day and night, that when we become like trees planted by streams of water. We produce fruits in season. We do not wither. In fact, we prosper. Now, I admit, studying all the detailed laws in Leviticus doesn't seem that great to me, but being like a tree planted by streams of water does sound pretty good. I mean, that's a tree that's going to thrive and be healthy. I want to thrive and be healthy. Don't each of us want to thrive and be healthy? Don't we want to be full of life? I want to produce everything I'm capable of. I want to be who I was made to be and not a cheap shade of who I am. I don't want my hopes, my dreams, my passions, my happiness to wither away. What about you? Have you ever felt like you're withering? Have you ever felt like your dreams and your hope and your life is just withering away? 
I had a friend growing up, we'll call him Patrick, who had a troubled life. His parents weren't around much, and he didn't seem to pay him any attention at all. He was in trouble a lot in elementary school and in junior high. He was always in the principal's office, always in in-school detention. He always was in trouble. He was smart and talented, but all that just seemed to be withering away, and all that seemed to replace it was anger and disappointment. I didn't understand why then, but I always wondered why he acted the way he did. He had so much talent and intelligence, but it was just withering away, and he was just angry and in trouble and mean. The psalmist says in Psalm 1 that the way of the wicked shall perish, that they are like chaff, the wind just blows away and scatters. I didn't think Patrick was wicked, but his potential, his life was in danger, just blowing away like chaff, everything that it could be, just slowly blowing away. If he kept to the path he was on, he'd perish one way or the other, maybe not in physical death, but... How many of us know people who just seem like their life has perished before them? And they get up, and they go to bed, and the life is just gone from them. But the psalmist says, the way of the righteous will prosper. It's the way of delighting in the law and meditating on it day and night. You know, I, I think the law of God gets a bad rap. We tend to think of, of laws as things that restrict us and rules designed to control us. Sometimes they are. But there's a deeper reason behind the law. Why did my parents give me a curfew? Why did you give your children one? Why did your parents give you one? Was it to keep us from having fun? Or was it to protect us from making bad choices, getting into trouble, being out late when bad things tend to happen? Why did you want to protect your children? Why did your parents want to protect you? Why did you make most of the rules you make in your household? If your house was anything like mine, there were rules because there was love. Every rule you made was out of that first rule you made for your children and for yourself. Rule number one was that you loved your family. Every other rule you made supported and helped you keep rule number one. This house is a house of love. The law of God is often equated with the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, but do you want to know what law number one is? Rule number one is God loves us. That's rule number one. Everything else in the law of God, the first five books of the Bible, is about getting us to believe and live by that law, that God loves us. In fact, it goes far beyond the first five books of the Bible. It's the entire thing, the entirety of Scripture. It's God's story of getting us to live by the law of God, that God loves us. How much would our lives change if we actually believed the God of the universe, the creator of all things, loves each and every one of us. We too often believe that God couldn't love us. We believe we aren't good enough to be loved. We believe God is just out to get us, that God is angry, that God is wrathful, that God demands punishment, that if you break this rule, this rule, this rule, then you'll be in trouble. In fact, he was so mad at us, he had to kill his own son to make and feel a little better about it. But that's not the story of the cross. That's what we, we get told sometimes, that we are unlovable and God had to kill his son to make him love us. That's not in the least bit true. Christ loved us very literally to death. Christ took on death because God loves us. God's rule number one is God loves us. That's the law of God. Faith is living into that truth and living by the law of love, God's love for us. That's what the psalmist says should be our delight, like a dog jumping for a new toy, like children giggling and joyfully playing in water. God loves you. Now that we can't delight in more than rules about goring oxen. The God of the universe loves us. No matter what else happens,
happens, what anyone else thinks or says or judges about you, God loves you. Meditate on that day and night. God loves you. When you wake up and dread that coming day, just meditate on the law of the universe that God loves you. When you make a big mistake and everyone is mad at you, just meditate on the law of the universe that God loves you. When you're told you're not good enough, not strong enough, not pretty enough, not talented enough, not rich enough, just meditate on the law of the universe that God loves you. When you finish a tough day and wonder why you even keep trying, just meditate on the law of God that God loves you. When you get ready for bed and wonder what the point of life is, just meditate on the law of God, that God loves you. When you want to make a difference in the world and wonder if you can, meditate on the law of God, that God loves you. It's easy to be a tree planted by streams of water when you are so deeply focused on the truth that God loves you. When you are reminded of a deep and abiding love that is for you, you find strength and happiness and prosperity. Life is richer when there is love. And God's law says there is enough love for you. Always enough love for you. In fact, a love so strong, nothing in all of creation can possibly separate you from it. Meditate on that day and night. It makes all the difference in the world to know that, to meditate on on that, to delight in that, that God loves us, that no matter what else happens, there is a deep and abiding love for us, that we matter, that we are loved. In junior high, Patrick was taken from his home and his parents and placed in a foster home with parents who eventually adopted him. At first, you could tell it was pretty rough for him, but then things began to change almost imperceptibly at first. He was happier. He wasn't getting into trouble. He was excelling in school and in sports. In high school, he made the football team and was on the honor roll. He got a scholarship to university. A lot of people were surprised. I mean, it looked like he was on the path for destruction. He was the kid that the teacher said to the next year, to the sixth grade teacher, you don't want Patrick in your class. You know those kids. And suddenly he turned in to the kid everyone wants in their class. The one who helps put away the chalkboard and erasers. We didn't have those anymore by the time I was in high school. The whiteboard and erasers. <laughs> the kind of kid who excelled in sports, who was a leader in the clubs. The kid who was just nice to everyone. He was like a tree planted by streams of water producing fruit, but not long ago he looked like he'd be chaff driven away by the wind. Not long ago I talked with Patrick and, and I finally had the courage to ask him about this sudden shift in his life. He said when he was placed with his foster parents they kept telling him how much they loved him. And at first it was odd and kind of weird and awkward for him. He wasn't used to that, what's all this hugging stuff? They said it every morning, every time he left for somewhere, at the end of every phone call. They showered him with love like he'd never known before. And, and eventually when he felt loved, when he believed he was loved and lovable, he began to believe in himself and his life, that it was actually worth something and not something to be thrown away. When he believed he was loved, he believed his life was worth something. Each and every one of your lives is worth something because you are loved by the God who creates and holds everything in the palm of God's hands. There are two paths in life. And he changed his from the way that will perish to the way that will prosper when he began to delight in the love that was given to him. Are we delighting in the love that was given to us? showed for us on that cross, given to us at this table? 
Are we delighting in the love that this meal represents, that says, I will love you to death, that this, this is my body broken for you, this is my blood shed for you, for the remission of your sins, that nothing can possibly keep you from me, that I will be with you forever. This table is something to delight in. And I'll be honest, growing up when I, I knew it was a communion Sunday, I'd be like, Mom, we should, we should go home after church because it's probably going to run long, you know, and you have to get dinner ready. We, we should probably just skip church because I didn't want to have to sit through communion. None of you have ever felt that way, have you? <coughs> but as I grew older, and as I understood the love that this table shows, well, that's a special thing. It's a living reminder. Reminder. Calvin said it's a seal, it's a sign of God's promises to us. And God's promise to us, God's first promise to us, is I will love you forever. That you are mine. And so this table is for you. Come and taste of the love of God. This table is big enough for all people. God loves each and every one of you. It doesn't matter what religion you are, what what things you've done, whether you're Presbyterian or Catholic or Lutheran or Baptist or whatever, whether you're rich or poor, black or white, from this country or another country, this table is for you because God's love is for you. Never let anyone keep you from God's love because God said nothing's going to keep my love from you. Never let anyone keep you from the love of God. Christ died so you can have it. No one else can ever take this table is for you. This bread and this cup, they're for you. They're the love of God. And so we share this meal and we remember the words of Paul who said, on the same night Christ was betrayed, he took bread. And after he blessed it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And Paul goes on to say, for as often as we eat this bread, and we drink the cup. We proclaim Christ's death until he comes again. And when we proclaim Christ's death, we proclaim rule number one. 